Mohamedou Buhari, retired army major general and former military dictator, former chairman of the Corrupt Petroleum Trust Fund, a government corporation that operated like an alternative government. Mohamedou Buhari, the man whose military regime became the first to sentence a woman to death by firing squad. This film tells the story of Buhari's past political career and what the future may hold for a Nigeria that falls under his rule again. What does the future hold for a Nigeria ruled by General Buhari? The APC has promised Nigerians that a vote for General Muhammad Buhari will liberate them from the current economic hardship. Achievements of President Jonathan, including the construction of an airport, the establishment of our Madri schools, as well as the considerable success in curbing insurgency in the north. Nigeria declared independence from Britain in 1960 and despite great promise, the country has suffered from violence between northern and southern Nigerians, Christians and Muslims, different ethnic groups including the Igbo, Yoruba and Hausa, and from repeated military coups and dictatorial governments. In 1979, the country elected its first democratic civilian president in many years, Shehu Shigari. However, Shigari's civilian government lasted less than four years as he was overthrown in a military coup led by Northern military officer General Muhammadu Buhari. The new leader, General Buhari, had two days notice from officers organizing the coup that he would be the new head of state his qualification, his political and economic experience. Buhari had previously been governor of several states in northeastern Nigeria, in the area that is currently witnessing fighting between the Nigerian armed forces and the violent Islamists of Boko Haram. He had also acted as petroleum minister, a position with great importance in a country where most state revenue comes from oil sales. General Buhari was also the head of the Petroleum Trust Fund, or PTF, a government-owned organization that handled large quantities of oil revenue. An official investigation years later, instituted by then President Olashegan of Asanju in the 1990s, revealed that a shady consultancy company called the Afri Projects Consortium or APC, had been contracted by PTF as management and project consultants. Buhari, as executive chairman of PTF, delegated to this APC the power to push through projects and make budgetary decisions. AFRI Projects Consortium, APC, assumed absolute powers of conceptualization, approval and execution of all projects. A PTF trustee called Captain Usman Jibril later recalled that Buhari bought in the late Ahmad Salahijo, his in-law, without informing us. We just saw these boys in the meeting. We asked him who are these boys? He said that they were just helping him to take notes. We didn't know that he engaged them as consultants without our knowledge and consent, because we are all members. I told him that it was wrong. As trustees, if something went wrong, 
we were the people that would be prosecuted, not any other person. I asked them to change the procedure and they were not ready to change it. I said, OK, bye bye. Ahmed Salahijo was mysteriously reported dead the very day a committee was set up to probe the PTF. The APC was indicted for overcharging the PTF for up to 25 billion naira and an internal management committee also reported that substandard soon to be expired drugs were sold at overinflated prices. On the week of January the 11th 2010 Nigeria's This Day newspaper reportedly got hold of an exclusive copy of a report by the Petroleum Trust Fund Interim Management Committee. The report outlined that the AFRI Projects Consortium had collected almost $200 billion in revenue from the Nigerian government. The scale of the corruption was simply staggering and shocked readers in Nigeria. When he took up power, Buhari began arresting and imprisoning state governors that he accused of being corrupt. Yet this punishment was not dealt equally to all parts of the country. In southern Nigeria, where the residents tend to be Christian, Buhari's regime was swift to throw public figures in prison without evidence or trials. In the north, however, where the political classes tend to be Muslims and share the same ethnic background as Buhari, the situation was different. Only one northern governor, Apa Aku of Benue State, was imprisoned. He was also the only governor in the region from a Christian ethnic group. The Nigerian musician, Fela Kuti, who had faced oppression and violence from previous Nigerian regimes, sang the following lyrics in protest. Driver get accident, na conductor Buhari charged to court. Under Buhari's military regime, people from all sections of society were detained without fair trials and subjected to inhumane conditions in dark prisons at his whim. Politicians, tribal leaders, musicians, civil society leaders, all were put in prison sometimes sentenced to terms as long as 600 years without evidence. Public figures who were cleared by civilian courts would be re-arrested and imprisoned under emergency laws passed by Buhari's government, especially the infamous State Security Decree No. 2, which allowed anyone to be imprisoned by the government. Prisoners were denied medications they needed to survive Others emerged blind from prisons that had no windows. Taye Sholarin was one of the regime's critics that was jailed, and he was denied access to asthma medication that he needed. Other public figures were put in jail and tortured, accused of corruption. Yet most of these have since been declared innocent, and in some cases, the Nigerian government has later issued apologies to the prisoners and their families for the way they were treated by Buhari. Indeed, in some cases, the politicians he jailed have subsequently been honoured as some of the best performing and least corrupt figures of the time, and several have had universities and other public facilities named after them. One former politician who spent the entirety of Buhari's regime in prison despite no evidence ever being presented against him later said that After the Buhari regime put me in prison for serving my country so selflessly, I felt Nigeria was not worth dying for or sacrificing for. He was subsequently cleared of any wrongdoing and received an apology from the Nigerian state. Conversely, politicians loyal to Buhari who had committed crimes for which there was ample evidence were not prosecuted. One state governor was arrested at Heathrow Airport in London with over £35 million sterling, yet he was never charged or investigated. 
Buhari also protected another state governor, whose administration had authorised a massacre of peasant farmers who were protesting after the government had confiscated their land without compensation. Buhari also failed in his oversight of the nation's economy and government finances. When he took over, the government had been negotiating a contract to improve rail transport infrastructure in Lagos and between other cities across Nigeria. In a city with constant traffic gridlock, this initiative would have revolutionised transport and allowed the population to move freely. In 1982, under the civilian regime, the government signed a $700 million contract for the rail project with a French consortium. The Lagos government was required to pay only 10% of this money, while the balance was to be paid on favourable loan terms by the consortium. However, Buhari decided to abandon the project since he was uninterested in developing transport and other infrastructure in a part of the country where he had enjoyed little support. As a result, the government forfeited $60 million to the contractors and rail transport in Lagos and Nigeria stalled for over 20 years. One of Fela's hit songs was based on the disappearance of 2.8 billion naira in missing money that was stolen under Buhari's watch as petroleum minister and head of the NNPC in 1978. 2.8 billion naira, while money is in missing. 2.8 billion naira, while money is in missing. Then set up inquiry, the same money no lost to you. The Dabaru, everybody. Under intense public pressure, the Shigari government, which took over shortly thereafter from the military regime, set up a Senate probe, which traced the money to a London Midland bank account belonging to Buhari. The value of 2.8 billion naira in 1978 was three billion dollars, or in today's naira value, 555 billion naira. The existence of this bank account in Buhari's name was later revealed in an interview by the leader of the Nigerian Senate on national broadcaster NTA. When the NTA interviewer reported this, she lost her job. But the woman went to court and presented all the evidence and won a case of wrongful dismissal. Predictably, the first act of Buhari and his cohorts once they were in power was to ransack the Senate and destroy all papers relating to the 2.8 billion Naira probe. To summarise the state of security under Buhari's regime, Professor Wole Shoyinka expressed shock that any Nigerian would ever contemplate voting for Buhari as a president. According to Shoyinka in court, Bahari enslaved the nation. He gloated and glorified in a master-slave relation to the millions of its inhabitants. It is astonishing to find that the same former slaves, now free of their chains, should clamour to be ruled by one who not only turned their nation into a slave plantation, but forbade them any discussion of their condition. A documentary currently showing on Nigerian television entitled The Real Buhari gives insight into the state of affairs at the time. The Buhari government, in persecuting its war on corruption, gave the National Security Organization NSO, unprecedented powers of arrest and detention. The regime enacted the state security of detention of persons decree number two which gave the NSO the power to detain anyone suspected to be a security risk indefinitely. All forms of freedom were restricted and there was severe deprivation of fundamental human rights under Decree 2. Under this decree, 
journalists were hung, drawn and jailed, and more than a dozen press houses were closed down. Labour unions and professional associations were prescribed and banned. The Nigerian Medical Association, the National Association of Resident Doctors, National Association of Nigerian Students and the Academic Staff Union of Universities. The Nigerian Bar Association later invalidated all proceedings of Buhari's military tribunals. The National Security Organization, Nigeria's first secret police, intimidated, harassed and detained protesters, demonstrators, students, lecturers, critics, activists and civil servants who dared to embark on strikes. People convicted of other crimes were also treated to severe punishment and denied access to appeals and proper judicial processes. Gladys Iyama, locked in a federal maximum security prison, was a crippled mother of two paraplegic children and was the first woman in the history of Nigeria to be sentenced to death by firing squad. The Buhari government knew the implication of executing a paralyzed mother of two and the sentence was secretly approved. The Gloria Ocon case was another example. In 1985, Gloria Ocon was arrested at a Nigerian airport on drug trafficking allegations. The case was traced to persons in government who had provided security support for their drug couriers. Gloria Ocon was said to have died in detention. The cause of the death was kept secret. To date, Gloria Ocon is a mystery. On the 20th of March 1984, the Buhari regime launched what it called a war against indiscipline. The little but important everyday manifestations of indiscipline, such as rushing into buses, constituting ourselves into public nuisances, working without commitment. Up to this moment, there has been no formal declaration of war against indiscipline. It is my pleasure, therefore, to declare today the launching day for the war against indiscipline. The war against indiscipline highlighted real small-scale problems that Nigerians experienced, but the way that Buhari's government went about addressing them was brutal and disproportionate and made the regime unpopular with ordinary Nigerians. Many Nigerians will never forget horsewhip lashes that lacerated their backs for not queuing up at bus stations or for even dropping a piece of paper. Soldiers beat up policemen on the streets, civilians were regularly harassed by military men. The situation quickly became intolerable. Men were forced to do frog jumps and were humiliated in front of their wives and children. Taken together, these draconian measures brought protests and criticisms from journalists and the general population but Buhari's regime moved quickly to crush dissenting voices. There was the Authoritarian Decree 4, under which it was a punishable offence for anyone to publish any material that was deemed embarrassing to any government official. Journalists were arrested and could be charged with criminal public order offences even if what they had written was true. On Decree 4, Buhari has remained unrepentant. It did not matter whether the story reported was true or not. If my regime did not like it, the writer would go to jail. Using this draconian decree, which allowed for indefinite detention of political opponents, the government of General Mohamedou Buhari sentenced the singer Fela Kuti to 10 years in jail. Ransom Kuti, the singer's brother and a prominent doctor, 
used the Medical Association as a platform to campaign for the release of his brother and other political prisoners. But Ransom himself was jailed in response to his efforts to achieve justice. The austere society that the Buhari regime attempted to create made reference to other regimes, such as that of the Taliban in Afghanistan, that used everyday violence and intimidation to crush freedom amongst the population. The impression that was created in the minds of people in the time of Buhari, especially Buhari and Ijiabo, was that this the time to be sober, the time not to smile, Yet again, however, Buhari's treatment of corruption was quite different when it was undertaken by his allies rather than those who opposed him. There was the case of the 53 suitcases involving an aide to Buhari. The aide's father bought 53 suitcases through Lagos Airport, which was said to contain foreign currency. Customs agents were prohibited from searching these items, despite the fact that the Buhari administration had placed a ban on the importation of foreign currencies. In 1984, Buhari planned and authorized one of the most infamous incidents of his presidency, which saw a team of Nigerian and Israeli spies kidnap a Nigerian political exile in London with the aim of bringing him back to Nigeria. Umaru Diku had been close to the civilian regime that Buhari had deposed and had moved to London with a number of other officials who feared for their safety after the military coup. 